I made a little decision I hope you'll be happy about. Oh, honey, you finally got Botox. You got a little more work done, huh? Yeah, just a little bit, just a tweaky. And I mean, it is the two essentials, food and Botox. Um, how y'all doing? No, dude, your face. Did you get Botox? Oh, you guys can tell? You don't look upset. Huh, oh, it's the Botox. I can't show emotion for another hour and a half. If you're using Botox or any of the other neuromodulators like Dysport and Xeomin, et cetera, there are some mistakes that are commonly made that could be hurting you. So make sure you watch this video and get informed. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Amir Karam, board certified facial plastic surgeon and founder and creator of KaramMD Skin. I specialize in facial rejuvenation, which basically means I help people look as young as they feel. We're gonna talk about Botox. Now, Botox obviously is a very common, very widely understood cosmetic procedure, but there are things, 10 things, that if you don't do it well or do it right, you could actually be hurting yourself with it and you could actually not be getting the op optimal results that you deserve and seek. So this video, we're gonna break down 10 mistakes that people make when it comes to Botox that could actually be hurting their results. Botox or any other type of neurotoxin, whether it's Dysport, Xeomin, uh, you know, Daxi, all these other ones, but they all have the same principles behind them. I've been doing this for a very, very long time. You know, obviously all I do is surgery, but I've had a long history of injecting Botox myself. So trust me, I've learned the hard way, some of these lessons, and I wanna pass them along to you. So without further ado, let's break it down. Mistake number one, too much Botox. People have this notion that you should literally not move your entire upper face for the Botox to be effective. And by the way, when I say Botox, I'm kind of lumping all of the uh, neuromodulators into one phrase here, so just to make it easy. I can't tell you how many times I heard that from patients I used to inject. They would come in two or three weeks later, they're like, oh, look, I can move a little bit of my forehead or I had a little bit of crow's feet or, you know, there's a little bit going on here. Folks, that's not the point of Botox. You don't wanna look frozen. You don't wanna look like a, like a mannequin. That's not the idea here. That's not pretty, that's not natural, that's not anti-aging. This is the principle, and I want you to really capture this and understand this. As we age, and I've done other videos on this topic, the skin thins as a result of loss of collagen and elastin. Those are two molecules that are made by the fibroblasts and, and the keratinocytes in the cells. As we age, starting in our late 20s and early 30s, and then really rapidly into our 40s, 50s, and beyond, collagen production, elastic production diminishes. Therefore, the skin gets thinner, doesn't become as elastic. And every time you express and you frown and you raise your forehead and you squint, the same muscles that were working when you were in your 20s, same muscles that were working your whole life when you're a teenager, are still working, but the difference is the skin is not as supple, and as a result, it bends, right? There's a little bit of a bend along where that muscle contracts. As the skin gets thinner, the impact of those muscles become greater, right? You, become, you start to see them. So a line that's there only when you're frowning or raising your forehead or creasing when you're smiling, etc., goes from being there dynamically, meaning during the aspect of, of movement, to eventually, transitioning to becoming a static line, a line that's there even when you're not expressing. That in and of itself is the kind of the purpose and the rationale behind doing Botox, to prevent dynamic lines from turning into static lines. At the core of it, at the underlying premise of it, if you keep your skin thicker, keep your collagen building, keep your skin from breaking down, well, guess what? You don't probably need as much Botox or even need it, period. I mean, you know, you, you see certain ethnicities that have thicker skins, more supple skin, or take really great care. Individuals take great, their skin doesn't crease the way it does if you're a sun worshiper and you have never used skincare and never used sunscreen, et cetera. When it comes to the first principles, the first principle is skin thinning. Second principle is preventing dynamic lines from turning into static lines. So that should dictate how much Botox you should be using. All you need is enough to take the oomph out of the muscle to keep it from full-blown you know, creasing. Because it's difficult when you get older, you get to an age where you need to have like a, a facelift or some kind of, you know, like a vertical restore, some type of facial rejuvenation procedure, and you've got these deep lines that are set in your skin, there's no remedy for them at that point. So keeping them from forming is really important. And it comes down to skincare on one hand 
and you know, a little bit of Botox. And when I say a little bit, just enough to take the oomph out. The beauty of it, the, the elegance of it, the sophistication of Botox injection is to use just enough to get that balance where you decrease the movements so they don't form these lines and you prevent the lines from transitioning on there. But it's totally okay to have movement and it looks really beautiful and normal to have some movement. So don't consider it a failure of Botox. Don't go running back to your injector and say, hey, I need more, I need more because I have a little bit of movement. That's not the idea. All right, so too much Botox is mistake number one. Mistake number two is getting Botox too often. Same idea that I just mentioned before. Botox is biologically designed to last three or four months. And why it lasts three or four months is because what happens is at the nerve muscle junction, we call it neuromuscular junction, there's a signal that comes from your nerve, sends what are called neurotransmitters. They're basically like little keys, if you will, that bind to the muscle side, right? They cross the nerve towards the muscle. The key goes into a lock called a neurotransmitter synapse, goes in there and it basically causes the muscle to contract. Like you think about raising your forehead, you raise your forehead. The nerve causes the muscle to do that through acetylcholine, which is just a neurotransmitter. Now, I don't wanna to get too deep into the science, but that's the idea is this, this lock and key mechanism. What Botox does is it has the same key as the neurotransmitter, it goes into the receptor on the muscle side and it blocks those neurotransmitters from being able to go from the nerve to the muscle. So when it blocks it, you can't move it. You can't contract the muscle. That's how it works. Let's say you have 100 you know, receptors, 100 of them get bound by the Botox, there's no movement, right? If you put a little, a little bit less Botox, maybe you'll bind 80% of them. So you have some movement, but not all of them. But guess what happens? The minute that goes in, the muscle starts recognizing that these are taken, and then it starts going through a process of growing new receptors, fresh receptors that have no Botox in them to, to bind them. And once that number reaches a certain level, the muscle goes back to having full function. That process typically takes about three or four months, right? When that process takes place, after that, the Botox is essentially worn off, and you are starting from scratch, which is gonna lead us to the next mistake, but basically, the window of around three to four months is a good place because it hasn't completely, completely worn off, but yet it's almost there, so you take your next dose. But doing it too early, first of all, you're wasting your money because as long as those are bound, you can't get more Botox to stick in, in the receptors that are, that are uh, going on. Secondly, you don't want your muscle to basically have zero, zero movement ever. Like you want it to start getting out because while the muscle is not working, it's atrophying. And atrophying of the muscle is literally like what happens to your arm when it goes into a cast. You know when it comes out, it's like spaghetti noodle, there's very little muscle there. Same thing is happening to that muscle. When it's not functioning, it's not, it's not uh, strengthening, and as a result, it atrophies. So you don't really want your muscles to be permanently atrophied. You want it to get to some strength back and then go again, some strength back and then go again. So, mistake number three, waiting too long between sessions to get your next Botox. Because here's the thing, there's not anything technically wrong with letting it all go away. Like let's say you decide you wanna wait six months to, to, to do that. There's nothing technically wrong with that. In fact, it could be a very deliberate strategy and a choice that you might wanna make. So I don't wanna make you think that there's something you know, terrible about it. But if your goal is to quiet the area enough to where you're preventing the lines and wrinkles from forming, if you do it, let's say every six months, well, you're gonna have three months where you have full strength of that muscle again. And therefore it's impacting the tissues and it's making the changes into that area. But if you do it every three to four months, then as it starts to come out, then you knock it down again, and it starts to come out and you knock it down. But for the most part, it's kind of like evenly down. So number one, your appearance isn't gonna change a lot. You're not gonna go from like having full movement, then not having movement, you know, imparting some, some skin aging changes to not having that. You're basically, you'll be in this like steady state where you kind of look the same visibly, you feel the same, you know, aesthetically, and you're kind of in a good spot. So doing it, waiting around too much, like doing it once a year, or once every nine months, eh, doesn't really accomplish the real goal. However, know that during, if you, let's say, did it once a year, or did it twice a year, and, you're, and your muscle's not really working for six months, well, that's, you're decreasing that evolution from dynamic to static wrinkle by 
So still making an impact, it just could be making a better impact. So it's not totally wrong to do that. It might not be ideal according to your goals, right? So that's the whole point. If your goal is to be like really on top of it, you wanna do it every three to four months. Number four, not disclosing your medical history. There's nothing really unsafe about Botox. In fact, it's, it's been around for a long time. God knows how many millions and millions and millions and millions of people have had injections. I mean, it's probably the most commonly used cosmetic procedures. And it's been around for, I think, 40 years by now. I, I, I lose track of time, but it's been around for a long time. Probably longer, actually, than 40 years. But bottom line is, it's shown to be very, very safe. However, if you have certain neurologic conditions, you know, multiple sclerosis, you know, certain neurodegenerative issues, etc. you certainly want to disclose that and explain that to your, your doctor because some of them are potentially concerning to be used at the same time. Additionally, if you have allergies to certain components that are in the Botox, you want to make sure you, you mention that, right? So there, there's certain things that you definitely want to disclose like any other medical procedure, you want to be very clear and honest with your surgeon or your, your, I'm sorry, your injector. For example, if you had trauma to this particular area or some types of surgery or to this area, well, the relationship between you know this corrugator muscle and the muscle that closes your eyes, for example, might not be as pristine because of some history. And as a result, you put the Botox here, then it seeps into your eyelid. Now you can't open your eyelid for three months, right? So there are things that are associated with your medical history that you definitely want to disclose and definitely want to be clear about. At the end of the day, you know your medical history, just tell your injector what those are. And if they are a credible, good, solid medical practitioner, they will clearly know whether you're a candidate or not a candidate and what precautions should be taken. Number five, working out right after you've used Botox or got Botox injected. What you're trying to avoid is the Botox going to places where it shouldn't go. Like when you inject it in the corrugator, when you inject in the orbicularis muscles, you want it to go right there. Because let's say hypothetically, this orbicularis muscle goes around the eye. Right on that cheekbone, just very close to that, is the insertion of the zygomaticus major muscle, right? What does that mean? It's the muscle that affects your smile right? It's the muscle that affects your smile. So let's just say hypothetically, you get some injected here and then right afterwards you get out and you go to the gym, hot yoga, whatever, and you're doing stuff. Now that Botox that hasn't quite made it into the orbicularis muscle, hasn't gotten absorbed at that neuromuscular junction, it's kind of floating around underneath your skin. All that exercise, vasodilation, meaning like blood vessels ballooning up, opening up the skin, allowing the sweat to come through, etc. Now there's more passage, potential passage, for that Botox to kind of get into places where it's not meant to be. So you go from here, boom. Next thing you know, you're, you knock out part of your zygomaticus muscle and you've got a crooked smile for several weeks, months after, after the Botox. Terrible, terrible thing. Definitely something you want to avoid. Looks awful, you feel awful, you're self-conscious about it. So the idea is you don't want to exercise or lay down or do anything, you know, sort of posturally um, that could impact the, uh, the precision of the Botox that you're, you're using. Two, three hours, maybe just consider it like that day you don't exercise if you wanna be on the safe side. Number six, not using skincare before or after Botox. Folks, chicken or the egg, cart before the horse, whatever you wanna say it, but I'm telling you right now that the reason why you would benefit from Botox is not simply because of your age, it's because of the status of your skin. If you keep your skin thickening with collagen production and the use of the actives like retinols and vitamin C, et cetera, and protecting it from collagen degradation from you know, sun, your skin is gonna need less Botox and it's gonna be less likely that you're gonna form dynamic to static line transitions and have lines and wrinkles on your face with or without Botox. I'm telling you that the source of those is skin aging. So it behooves you, if you're gonna spend all this money on you know, quarterly Botox injections, it behooves you to get to the source of the problem and use skincare that's actually going to improve the status of your, your skin anatomically and, and functionally over time. And that is with the use of like retinols and niacinamide and you know, vitamin C, et cetera. All of the things that are in the CaramMD trifecta and that's really why I developed it the way I developed it so that it could include all those important anti-aging things. But that is your foundation. 
don't think of Botox as, as skincare. Botox is not skincare. Botox is transition from you know your wrinkle prevention, but the source of it is because of your skin. So get the skin part you know dialed in, and you're less dependent on the Botox. Trust me on that. That's the key. Number seven is kind of like what we talked about earlier. It's not following post-care instructions. Look, every injector has common practices about what they ask you not to do. Like I said, not sleeping, not exercising, certain things. Others have very specific things based on the way they inject, where they inject, how they inject, you know, how much they inject, all these different aspects that you need to really pay attention to. So make sure that you get those post-care instructions Look at them carefully. If you have any questions about them, make sure you ask, because the last thing you wanna do is assume, just because you've had Botox five times with a different practitioner, uh, that when you switch to the next person, that you're gonna follow the same set of instructions. Because again, like I said, there's a lot of nuances around this, and it's not always the same. Number eight, going to an unskilled professional. All right, so I think that goes without saying, right? I mean, if, you're, if you care about your outcome, your appearance, et cetera, and it's your face after all, don't underestimate how artfully and skillfully Botox can be done to achieve excellent results. Because like I said, at the end of the day, it's not just about like killing off that muscle, knocking it down, keeping it from being able to move, frozen face look, et cetera. The real artistic, real skilled, Botox injectors know how to play the game so that the overall look looks more refreshed, looks more, more youthful, looks more vibrant by, because it's a push and pull. Like for example, the muscles of your forehead lift your eyebrows, right? So if you're looking for a lift, you wanna inject less in your forehead. The muscles around here pull the eyebrow down. So you would want to inject more here if your idea is wanna lift the entire brow upward, right? Including this corrugator here. So for example, if you wanna lift somebody's brow, you put more here, more here, less here, right? There's a balance, there's a play that goes into it. And if you're older, let's say your brows have come down because of sagging. Well, in a condition like that, last thing you wanna do is put Botox in your forehead, no matter how many lines you have up here. Because when you do that, your brows will sit heavier on your rims and you'll look more tired and more age because everything is like this and you can't raise it because the injector put too much in. There's a lot of nuances with it. And he's, if you know, you're with somebody who really knows what they're doing, as you're aging decade after decade, they're adjusting the amounts of Botox to, to fit you specifically and not just like, you know, this is how we do it, boom, boom, boom. This is how we've been doing it. And then you walk out and it, you, know, you, look, you look terrible. So the bottom line is you wanna make sure you're with somebody who's experienced, reputable, and you feel like there's a commonality among the aesthetic and anti-aging and rejuvenation approaches that you wanna take. Now, the other thing I wanna point out to you is if you bounce from professional to professional, unlikely you're gonna get a great result because each professional will do something slightly different. And the only way to know if what they did was, was right is to be able to see you back and get your feedback to say, hey, that was a little too much on my forehead, I couldn't raise it enough, or that was not enough on my, you know, in this area I was moving it too much, and then make an adjustment the second or third time so that you dial in, based on your body's feedback, what's the right amount. So I, I used to always find it very frustrating when somebody would like bounce around and uh, you couldn't dial down the treatment the way you needed to be because you know, you're cleaning up somebody else's mess or you know, play, going off of somebody else's approach. So it's better to, to find somebody, stick with them at least a few times to get a sense of how they're gonna do it and then decide if they're, they're right for you or not. But uh, be, be careful about you know, being in the wrong hands. Number nine, not researching your needs. You know, Botox in the upper face, very common, right? You've got your crow's feet, you've got your corrugators, your levens, if you want to call them your frontalis, the muscles that cause the horizontal lines here. Once you start dropping into the, the lower half of the face, your depressor muscles around your, you know, the angles of the, of the mouth, um, you know, different aspects that are going to affect the smile or going to affect, you know, the mentalis muscle, this chin area, etc. Those areas are all very, very specific and nuanced and you gotta understand what you can expect from them. For example, let's say hypothetically you have neck bands, right? Well, if you're 30 something, like my wife, when she was in her 30s, she had very strong, you know, dynamic neck bands. That means like when she's talking and chewing and all of a sudden the muscles are flexing all throughout her neck. A person like that is a perfect candidate for 
platysma Botox, right? And platysma is the muscle here. So you put some Botox in there and it quiets down the muscle. Beautiful. Now, take a 55 year old who has loose muscles in their neck from laxity and you inject Botox into them, it's literally gonna do nothing, right? It's not gonna do anything. There's a different need according to what your age is and what the condition is that is particular to you. So you gotta understand what the expectations should be for the particular approaches that you're interested in. Let's say the corners of your mouth come down. Well, again, corners of the mouth come down could be because of laxity or it could also be because of you have an overacting uh, depressor muscle. So a little bit of Botox here in that condition can help that. But if it's because of laxity, you have marionette lines, it's not gonna do anything, right? So there are these nuances that you need to research and understand before you just jump into it and do it because the last thing you wanna do is be disappointed, waste time, money, and all that kind of stuff and lose faith on you know, Botox's ability to help you for certain conditions. All right, number 10. All of these are equally important. Number 10 is important in a different way. And that is the use of SPF or sun protection. Folks, your skin aging is the reason why you're requiring Botox. That's a completely different way. I guarantee you, most of you haven't thought of it this way. But that's the reason, as your skin ages, you need it. Now, what's the greatest, most powerful accelerator for skin aging? It's the sun. In fact, 70 to 80% of the physical changes that you see in your skin during the aging process are amplified and directly related to the sun exposure you get on your face. So if you're going down this anti-aging road, then it behooves you to protect your skin against UVA and UVB sunlight. So what that means is if you're gonna be out and about, just put a physical sunblock on. I mean, you know, physical means zinc or titanium oxide. Um, LTMD makes a good one. A lot of different brands make a good one. I've done a lot of videos on the use of sunscreen and how to select them, etc. So definitely make sure you watch some of that. But really, at the end of the day, serious anti-aging of skin starts with sun protection. Next is the use of actives on your skin. And I've done a lot of videos on retinol and vitamin C and you know niacinamide and all these other ones that have very powerful impacts on skin anti-aging. So it behooves you again to educate yourself to understand you know, this, this relationship. And if you do those things, Botox has a place in the anti-aging toolbox, but has a very specific place, and you wanna avoid making these 10 mistakes and get the most out of it. All right, folks, I hope that helped shine some light on the subject. Um, I hope it gave you some perspective. Make sure you stay tuned for the next video that, that will be popping up here. And folks, if you enjoyed this video, make sure you like it. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, make sure you do so. I love educating and every week you'll get a fresh video in this category. If you want to learn a little bit more, follow the Karam MD journal, which is a newsletter I write that comes to your email, a little bit more in depth uh, topic conversations about various different things related to skin and facial anti-aging. Uh, share this with some friends and family. If you have any questions or comments, drop them down below. I try to get to as many of them as I possibly can. And uh, until next time, Dr. Amir Karam, thanks so much.